Turn in your Bible to the book of Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, on page 1210 in your church Bible, the old school field. Look in verse 17, verse 17. This is the one of the verses that most preachers don't like to cover, and I'm one of them. Because many times when you mention about somebody else teaching error, you look like you're just being critical. But the Bible says that you're supposed to feed the flock and warn the flock. So we try to teach you things that is not according to Scripture. When the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, it also says, not of works. When it says, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of yourself. So it tells you what it is and tell you what it isn't. So many times there's people that are saying things contrary to what God's word says. Not long ago I preached a sermon on who's afraid of the big bad wolf. Anybody remember that? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Well, there's a lot of wolves in the world. And some of you might even consider me to be one of them. But I, uh, I don't think so. But I do love the scriptures. But it says here in verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and join them. And avoid them. Isn't that what it says? I believe it is. Now, this morning, I want to speak to you on a subject that's very controversial. You may not even know what a Calvinist is. Many people don't. They don't even what the word refers to. Or the word Armenian. They, they don't know what it means. But boiled down, a Calvinist uh, believes that you have to mainly persevere in the faith. And if you don't persevere, then you're not saved at all. And so the only way you can prove that you are saved is by the way you live. So your life becomes your evidence that you're really a Christian. So you may not know a person who comes right out and says, I am a Calvinist, but they will have the teaching that gets a person to look at their life as the proof that they're saved. And if there's no proof, then you have a reason to doubt your salvation. I've heard that over and over again for many, many years. And so then you've got to get a person to get saved who really means business this time. I really mean business this time. It means I didn't make it the last time, but this time I'm starting all over fresh and new. I'm going to make it this time. And then you have people that or Armenian type, that means you can, you can get saved, but you lose your salvation. So um, you can have it, but you lose it. So a lot of weird things that goes on, and a lot of damage that it does. So I want to uh, explain a little bit about defining election. It's God's choice of an individual or a group for a specific purpose or destiny. In other words, all of you are in the world, but God selects different ones that he wants to save. And it's all God's choice. It's not left up to you. It's not your choice at all. It's God's choice. God picks out one. Now, what we don't know, and some explain it this way. Well, you know, all of y'all, whenever you were born, God has already got some of you wired that if he turns the light bulb, it'll come on. But if it's not wired and you turn the light bulb, it won't come on. So the only ones that even have the possibility of coming on are the one, ones that God has already pre-wired. And so people are going throughout the world turning light bulbs to see which one is going to light up. Ah, there is an elect. Because it lit up. So that sounds good, but it's not very good. Not if you are the one that wasn't wired. And therefore your light will never shine because God didn't predetermine you to be a light bulb. So gospel and Calvinism compared. Just might be difficult for you to read everything that's up there, but just listen to me. 
there is a big difference. Forget the word Calvinism if you have to, but look at what they teach. You see, the gospel says that Jesus came to save the world. Now, this is what I believe, that he came to save the world. Calvinists, he came to save the elect, those that he's already predetermined and wired them to receive it. And you can't be saved unless God predetermined you to light up. So I don't believe that. Jesus died for all men. See, I, I, that's what I believe, that he died for all men. But see, there's others who teach he only died for the elect, you know, the ones that he chose to save that are already pre-wired. He only had to die just for them. He didn't have to die for the others, just for those. So some people say, well, now this is rational. There's no sense in paying for the sins of the people that he ain't going to save anyway. So he just, you know, had to pay for the sins of a few. A God predetermined plan is Jesus as ransom for man and all who believe can be saved. I believe that God had predetermined that Jesus Christ would come into the world and down the cross and pay for all the sins of everybody so that anybody can be saved. They hear the gospel, they believe it. Now that's what I believe. We see, they believe Jesus, they chose some for salvation, sent Jesus and died for them and caused them to believe. See, whenever you believe the other way, you believe that God causes the person to believe. It wasn't their choice, but they were made to choose because God gave to them irresistible grace. And so they made this decision. So when you think, well, there's no real harm and no real damage done if you don't believe, you know, correctly. The difference can be heaven and hell. It can make a difference on whether or not you have that drive to want to witness to people. Because, you see, if I believe that if this is true, what's the damage if I don't witness? What did I harm? What did I hurt? Because if God's already chosen to go to heaven, they're going to go anyway. And if he didn't choose them, they're not going anyway. So why should I witness? It is a fatalistic teaching that really destroys a Christian's proper motivation to want to reach people. Because I believe that God can save anybody. He wants everybody. It makes a big difference in your whole life and how you view things. Jesus is the light of the world so that the world might be saved through him. They say he is the light of the world, but only the elect can be saved. The elect, from the gospel point of view, are those who are in Christ through faith. See, I believe that, yes, God has chosen to save all of those who put their faith in Christ. But that's not what they mean. Sometimes when people say things, you have to define your terms. What do you mean by that? And a lot of people say they're saved. Well, what do you mean by that? And some people don't mean the same thing you mean. So this is why you are to check all these things out. Now get this. We say that the, um, the tulip is the devil's favorite flower. It stands for something. Election has no conditions because God does it all and you actually have no choice whatsoever. When you talk about total depravity, see, I believe a man is totally incapable and adequate to save in himself. It doesn't mean the man can't reason and think. They say, well, if he's a dead man, then he's dead. So therefore, he can't do anything. God has to come and affect him first. It's not what the Bible teaches. So they have T-U-L-I-P, TULIP. Unconditional election. Because, you see, you had nothing to do with God choosing who he chose. If Calvinism is true. That God chose who he wants. It's not you choosing God. It's God choosing you. And some people, God didn't choose. So, therefore, they're not the elect. Now, it can sound good, and what I'm telling you, some of you might think, you know, that makes sense to me, and I may lose you, and you become a Calvinist. I understand the risk. But if I don't tell you, 
You can leave this church and you wouldn't even know it. You can go to a bunch of other churches and they'll teach Calvinism and you won't have a clue what they're teaching. You won't see anything because it looks so much like we're saying the same thing. No, we're not saying the same thing. Far from it. It's, it's important because it makes a difference on what is that gospel message you tell a person. And when you teach limited atonement, means that you, Christ only paid for certain people. It's not unlimited, it's, it's limited just to certain people. And irresistible grace, that when God has got you wired in the back, see, and when you turn that light bulb, it's already pre-wired, it's irresistible. It has to light up because of the way it's wired. Other people, they can't respond because, you see, they're not wired right. God didn't choose to save them. So then you have that if all this is true, if these four things is true, then perseverance of the saints will be automatic. If you're really saved, you will serve God. If you're really saved. I mean, if you're really saved, you're not going to want to go out here and do all those bad things. You ever heard statements like that? Where do you think it comes from? Not from the Bible. It comes from this teaching, and they may not use the word, but they will use the teaching. And multitudes of churches are teaching Calvinism, and it does a lot of damage to people. You would be totally surprised if I read to you all these letters that I get because of people that are finally understanding the gospel and the agony that they go through, wondering and questioning, how do I know I'm really one of the elect? How do I know that I'm really saved? Because they have to base it upon, well, they're not how you live it. So, to say that faith is the cause of the new birth is to put the cart before the horse. What they're doing is, they're saying that, you see, you can't get saved and have faith in God until, first of all, God takes the first move and regenerates you and saves you and gives you the new birth. Now because you've been born again, now you can put your faith in the Lord. That's backwards. You get the new birth because you put your faith in Christ. It's backwards. And some people cannot see it. So they don't try to win their loved ones to the Lord. They just wait because, see, if they're going to get saved, God's going to do it. They don't need you witnessing to them. And whenever they finally see it, because God did it, well, then they'll have their faith and put it in the Lord. Now, that might sound rational, but that's nuts. And I don't believe that, but they don't believe that. Now, when you hear a Calvinist tell you that that Yankee don't know what he's talking about, he doesn't understand real Calvinism. Yes, I do. But I peel away all the other stuff and get right down to the heart of the matter and say, this is what they're really saying. Because it's not a game to me. Faith is not the cause of the new birth, but the consequences of it. Arthur Pink teaches this. Calvinism. Faith is not the cause of the new birth. Yes, it is. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you get a new birth. You see, your faith, because you heard. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you heard the gospel and you believed the gospel, then you have been given a new birth. So, they're wrong. Wrong. Now, this is what he also said. The ultimate decision or destiny of every individual is decided by the will of God. And blessed it is that such be the case. If it were left to our wills, the ultimate destination of us all would be the lake of fire. In other words, if God didn't do that, Everybody would go to hell because nobody has within him the desire or the knowledge of coming to God. God has to give it to him. But faith cometh by hearing and hearing the gospel. So, yes, every man can be saved. Every man doesn't have to be lost. But I want to show you this. I did something wonderful the other day. I quoted John 3, 16. I want you to quote that verse with me. You say, how do you deal with a Calvinist? 
Let's quote John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now that's what you need to believe. You believe that? You say, don't they believe that? No, they believe something different. And I'll show you that in just a moment. They don't believe that God so loved the world and the world well, that doesn't refer to the world. That just refers to the elect. Anyway, they even have their own song. Joy to the elect, the Lord has come. Let the elect receive her king. But anyway, we ain't got time to sing all of that. But now let me show you this. There are those who do uh, salvation by loading it at the front with works or loading it at the back with works. But they're loading works on either side. So what do you mean? I'm glad you asked. <coughs> Front end loaders. That's doing works to get saved. Rear end loaders. Works to stay saved. Or to prove that you are saved. But your salvation depends upon those works. Take away the works. They say, well, those works don't save you. Okay, let's take all the works away. Are you still saved? Well, no, not without. No, wait, 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 wait. Works cannot save you. True. Works can't save. But why do you keep putting the works in there? Well, because it twists and perverts the true gospel of Christ. This message, this when it's twisted, did not come from God. God says a man is saved by grace without works. Now, some people think that repent and turning from your sin is what's going to wash and keep you clean because, you see, the problem is you have to wash yourself clean before you get saved or after you get saved you have to keep yourself washed to stay saved but it depends on what you do that's not what the bible teaches but there's many people who teach this and it is an error i don't worry about trying to wash up my flesh i'll just stick to christ's righteousness but when i trusted christ as my savior he gave me his righteousness as a gift I didn't earn it, didn't work for it. So in God's eyes, you won't believe this, but I am as righteous as God. How many of you believe what I just said is the truth? Let me see your hand. The rest of you are excused. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I am as righteous as God because of what Christ has done for me. Now, here is what we call the Armenian view. They look at salvation as a a race and so they think that the prize at the end of my race is going to be salvation eternal salvation but I got to run this race the track race represents salvation Christians may abandon the race and lose salvation because after all I'm just I'm tired of going to church I'm trying I'm tired of trying to live this good old Christian life I'm gonna see what the world's got out there for a while so I gave up the race, and I've lost my salvation. But before I die, I can always get back on the track race and keep running some more. But my salvation, see, depends upon my works. So I've got to do these good works. That's front-loading it. That's putting the load of works at the beginning. I've got to live the life in order to get the fruit. If I want salvation, I've got to earn it. Now, they won't say that. But if you don't live it, you can't get it. Confused. Now, the Reformed Calvinist view, the prize of salvation, eternal life, they believe they're already saved. But you see, they can't run toward the prize. They've got to run backwards because you've got, they've got to keep examining their life to see whether or not are they even on the racetrack. To prove, am I really saved? So I have to look at my life. How have I been living? What kind of a life have I got? And so my life is my proof of my salvation. So as I run, I've got to keep looking back to see whether or not am I saved or not. What are they looking at, Christ or their works? Looking at their works. But my salvation does not depend upon my works. But they will live their whole lives looking at what they've done. And the Armenian is looking what he's got to do. Something's wrong with this. Because all I had to do is look to Jesus. Look to the Lord. 
I trusted him. He saved me. Done. When he said it is finished, that was finished. There's no more work to be. He did the work. Best news I ever heard in my whole life. The very moment you hear, now get this, you must turn from your sins to be saved. Now, have you, let me be honest with you. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Almost all of you. There's a few of you that are still scared. You must, when you believe this, remember, you must automatically become a personal fruit inspector. Not only for fruits of righteousness, doing the right things, but also practicing sins must be eliminated from your life. You see, if you're going to look at a person and say, you've got to turn from your sins to be saved, that means you've got to stop being bad. And that means you've got to start being good. So when you become of that belief, you automatically become a fruit inspector. I've got to inspect my life. And if I don't measure up, I must not be saved. So people don't question and doubt in their salvation because of what they've heard. If you don't live it, you don't have it. And that is not true. You can have eternal life and never serve the Lord one iota. People say, you, that, that's, a, that's a damnable heresy. No, it's not. It's the gospel. That's what makes it good news that you can have it and have it forever. I believe that. They say, well, if you believe that, that's just a license of sin. You'll live like the devil. I've been saved 57 years, and I'm not living like the devil. I'm just going to say this, but it's not to be, you know, boastful. Or anything like that. I live as clean or as righteous as any man I know. And I believe this. This isn't ruining my life. This hasn't damaged me. I haven't, well, now that I'm saved, I can just live any way I please. Yes, I can. And I guess I just want to please the Lord. So what's wrong with that? Some people decide to live for themselves. And their Heavenly Father's got to chasten or discipline them. But whenever you do this, this is works for salvation, any way you cut it. Now, the hypothetical view. The prize is salvation, eternal life. The race represents salvation. One who is already saved, you cannot abandon the race. Because, you see, you have to persevere. You've got to persevere. And if you don't persevere, you can't quit. Because if you quit, it's a sign you weren't really saved to start with. So you've got to run this race and persevere in the faith. I'm so glad that I do not have to persevere. I've been preserved, <coughs> but I don't have to persevere. Because, you see, my salvation going to heaven depended upon what Christ did for me, not what I do for him. Now I can enjoy life. I can enjoy serving God because I don't have to. I do it because I love him. I do it because I want to. So, you think you're saved, but still might end up in hell. Some, even little people can understand this. I've had people say, well, I say, are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. Where are you going to die? Well, I don't know. Something's wrong. You don't understand what saved means. Saved means I can't go to hell. So have you been saved? I've been saved. Where are you going to die? Well, I don't know. Hell, if I don't change. You don't get it. Salvation is freely given. Excuse me, I'm having trouble finding this nonsense in my Bible. He ought to. Because, you see, that nonsense is not in the Bible. The Bible is very simple and very clear. Christ came into the world, died on the cross, and paid for our sins so that we could have as a free gift of everlasting life. Now, you'll hear a lot of people say, you've got to repent. You've got to repent. Repent, change your mind, think differently. It's okay. But whenever you mean by that and you give the impressions that you're talking about a person that has to turn from their sin, change their life, then you've got a whole new ball game going on. Like Jesus said, I want to forgive your sins, but I mean forgive you, but you haven't repented yet. You think the Lord says that? He that believeth in me, what? Hath everlasting life. That's all he asked is do you believe that what he did was for you? Even Batman knows the difference. <laughs> You'll hear him talk about you had to turn or burn, forsake or bake, try or fry. But it's salvation is a free gift. Then you'll want to just walk up just a slap my good one. Because they say God says, God didn't say some things. Don't say God said it when God didn't say it. How many unbelievers are lost? Let me ask you, how many unbelievers are lost? Now, this is a hard question. 
Jesus came to seek and to save that which was elect. Well, lo and behold. Now, can you see that word all in there? Great big letters. See it? A-L-L. -A -L -L. All. If he came to seek and to save that which was lost, how many was lost? All. All. And God have mercy upon preachers who limit the sacrifice that Christ made for the sins of the whole world. Is Calvinism biblical? No. Well, let's look at the verse. Look there in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, right there on your screen. Calvinism is biblical, and I can prove it from Scripture. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So is Calvinism in the Bible? There it is. It's the false teaching. Because it takes the truth of God and twists it. Changes it. If the word of God, if we're not supposed to take it seriously, I wouldn't bother about this. But I bother with it because there's so many Christians that are asleep. Because they fell in love years ago with Doris Day. Whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see. Whatever will be, will be. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe we make choices. I don't believe we're robots and everything's pre-programmed. I believe we're making decisions that we're going to have to answer to God for. You've got a mind. You've got a brain. Supposed to think. And he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4. He says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have the elect to be saved. All to be saved. And to come into the knowledge of the truth. God says, now how would you, would you what are you going to do? Get a pair of scissors and go through and you cut out all these verses that say this? <coughs> or you got to twist it. You got to change it. Well, it doesn't mean that. It does mean that. We take the word of God at face value. That God meant what he said. And I believe it. Anybody here ever heard of a guy named John Piper? John Piper, John MacArthur, R.C. Sproul. They're all the same. They teach everything I'm telling you right now. And you know what? They're on all these Christian stations all over the America, around the world. Why? Because there's Christians supporting them. People are giving them the money so they can have all this airtime. And people say, boy, they, they really know the Hebrew and the Greek. I bet I can take a six, seven, eight year old kid, read him John 3, 16. He can tell you what it means. But you can take some of these highfalutin theologians, they, don't, they can't explain it. they got to twist it all up, mess it all up. It's just keeping it simple. New birth is not conditional. Because, you see, God has to give you the new birth. So, therefore, you didn't do anything to do it. God has to do it. And then you get faith. No act of ours brings it about. It is supernatural. Final salvation from future judgment is conditional. It will not happen apart from our persevering faith. In other words, you've got to live it. And if you don't live it, dum da dum dum Katie barred the door. You didn't make it. You're running a race, but you run the race and you have to keep looking back. So see, some people, they put all of your good works at the beginning. You do all of this, and God will save you. Or you can get saved today. On the promise, that's why you've got to commit your life to Christ and promise to live for the Lord. And you load it on this end so that you're trusting in your works. What are they doing? Trusting in their works. God says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves you. You do not work your way to heaven. This church cannot get you to heaven. Your good work can't get you to heaven. Money can't get you to heaven. You cannot buy it. It's not for sale. The look on your face when someone says salvation is by obeying God and stop sinning. 
Some people understand what you said and understand what you meant. When you tell a person you've got to turn from your sins to be saved, they'll take it literally. Isn't that how it's meant? you got to stop your sin. Okay, which ones? All of them or just certain ones? Okay, what if I go back? It's a can of worms. Wouldn't it be better if God just offered to you as a gift? All you do is accept it. That's so simple even a child could understand it. And that's why he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all those intellectuals. Because they're the only ones that are going to be able to figure this thing out. Or all, go, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every what? Every creature. Because even children can understand that. It's the easiest thing in the world to understand. Unless somebody messes it up. And what do you think the devil wants to do? Keep people blinded to the truth of the gospel. We don't know who is elect and who isn't. Therefore, we preach to all the gospel message. So they said, well, we, said, we don't know who the elect are. So we just preach the gospel to everybody, and we don't know which one of those light bulbs are already pre-wired. That sounds good. But look at this next statement. <clears throat> then how do you know you're elect? And if God knows whom he chose, why do those whom he elected need to hear the gospel? If God has chosen something to go to heaven, something to go to hell, why do you have to tell anybody anything? Why tell anybody anything? Why do you have to preach the gospel to anybody? Because when they die, the ones he chose, they're going, and the ones that didn't, they ain't going. So what's the problem? It's a fatalistic teaching that rips the heart right out of God's people so they don't tell people the truth that, hey, anybody can be saved. God loves the whole world. That's why I despise this teaching. John Piper, John, Jesus chose me, this I know, for John Piper told me so. But those whom God did not select have no hope, they're not elect. Yes, Jesus chose me. Yes, Jesus chose me. Yes, Jesus chose me. John Piper told me so. Or John MacArthur, or R.C. Sproul. But you see, when you are claiming to be one of the elect, how do you know you are? How do you prove you're one of the elect? There's no way to prove it. There's no evidence. Well, you've got to live the life. Okay, you're going to live the life. What is the life? Well, you go to church. Does lost people go to church? Well, you're going to read your Bible. Can lost people read the Bible? Well, you're going to give money. Well, can't lost people give money? Well, if that's the evidence that proves you're saved, why doesn't that become the evidence to prove the lost man's saved? Same evidence. See, it won't work. It's either by grace or not at all. I probably shouldn't have put this in here about Joel Osteen. God has predestined your immediate health, wealth, and prosperity. And though the atonement be limited, your bank account is not. Now, that was just plain meanness to put that in there. Now, remember, you have to prove your faith. You've got to be able to prove you've got this faith. So to prove our faith in Jesus, let's fly that banana to the sun. This is how rational they think. It's just as stupid. Uh, but won't we, won't we burn up? We'll go at night. Yeah. <laughs> now some of y'all are going to get this about a half an hour from now. <laughs> First John 2, 2 says, And he is the propitiation, the satisfaction, the payment for our sins. And not, get that, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. <clears throat> Is that in the Bible? Yeah. That's in the Bible. The Bible says that. But they can't believe that, so they got to twist it and make it sound something else. When he says that God's not willing that any should perish, he's, well, that's the elect. They twist the scriptures. Romans 3, 21 says, But now the righteousness of God without the law, that means without works, the righteousness of God is manifested. In the word, the righteousness of God is Christ himself. And so when I accept Christ, I have his righteousness. 
I'm going to heaven on his righteousness, not mine. So I'm not worried about front loading it with works and back loading it with works. I'm saved by grace, kept by grace. Now, because it is by grace, I can choose voluntarily to serve the Lord. And I want to serve him with all my heart all the days of my life. But I don't do it to get saved. I do it because I am saved. But if I don't do it, I'm still saved. Just as saved as I've ever been. I was saved 56 years ago in a little old living room in Athens, Georgia. And since then, I haven't gotten any more saved. Everything I've done since then didn't help save me anymore. <laughs> I was saved that day. That's it. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Get this. Unto all, but upon them that believe. See, God's salvation is unto all. But it's only upon them that believe. That's consistent with everything Christ teaches. Can you see Jesus saying this? Sorry, man. I can't give you a free will. I'm not powerful enough. To give you free will and still be sovereign. See, Calvin is saying, God can't give you a free will because God is sovereign. He'd be given man sovereignty. The right to choose. <laughs> Duh. God gave to you I. So we word it this way. <clears throat> In the sovereignty of God, he chose to give us a free will. So can God choose to give you and I a free will? So we can accept or reject you don't have to love God. You can hate him if you want to. You can live like the devil if you want to. You can treat him despicable if you want to. You can spit in his face just like all those people did when he was on the earth. And when he went to the cross. All the wicked things that man did. And yet Christ died for all. He died on that cross. He paid for the sins of every person in the world. For there's no difference. That means he paid for all the sins of the homosexuals. Those are the abortion, murderers, thieves, robbers, liars. He died for everybody. And he offers his salvation unto all. But it's only upon those that believe it. God gave you the choice. You can believe it or not believe it. But this is what he says. You just say no to the tulip. Just say no to the tulip. They say, just say no to drugs. Just say no to sex. I don't get it. I can get excited. It's so easy. But I'm not. I'm very disciplined this morning. I'm going right by my notes here. But there were false prophets among the people, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Did Jesus Christ die on the cross to pay for the people that preach against him? Even the one that he bought them too. He paid for their sins. But he won't make you believe it. And they're false teachers. Making merchandise of people. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw the elect unto me. Did I read it right? No. I didn't read it right. What does he say? And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all unto me. Now, he will draw you with the light of reason. He's given you a brain. He's given you a world. So that you can know there is a God. Because the world is here and we didn't make it. It has design to it. <clears throat> he will draw you with a pull upon your heart. Because in your heart you know there is a God. And there is this desire to want to know the true and living God. If you will follow the light that you have. Light will always lead you to the source of light. But when you rebel against light. Then you'll walk in darkness. Because if you don't accept the light God gives, then he won't give you any more light. He will draw you with the call of the gospel. When the gospel is given, and God says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. If you hear the gospel and believe the gospel, then God calls you this way. And you have a choice. You can either accept it or reject it. But he draws. But you can also withdraw you don't have to accept any of the reasoning and you can become an atheist if you choose to you can become anything that you want to be God will not force you doesn't mean he doesn't love you but he did in his sovereignty chose to give you a free will 
So you can make up your mind. You can choose for yourself. But nobody can make this decision of accepting Christ for you. No one can do this for you. A lot of things people can do for one another, but this is one thing again. And Jesus told me, he says, and you will not come unto me that you might have life. And the reason they didn't say you could not, he says you will not. That means they had a will. They could have, but they did not. That's totally contrary to what the Calvinists teach. Unto all and upon all them that believe. When Christ died, he died for all. You ever seen somebody, I've lost my salvation again. Now I have to be born again for the fifth time. So many times I've seen people, have you ever been saved? Oh yeah, five, six times. How many times can you get saved? You can only get saved once. You can't get saved twice. Because you see, you can't get saved and then they'll lose it. It's impossible. So, you say that I'm not part of the elect. That a child, you can't tell them, look, God, God doesn't love you. Well, I'm not sure if he does. Well, Christ paid for the sins of the world. Well, I think, but I'm not sure he paid for yours. Or wouldn't you like to be able to say, even to a little boy and girl, God loves you. He sent his son to die on that cross and pay for your sins. And say that because you know it's true and you believe it. Well, I don't know if he's one of the elect or not. So aren't you sincere in what you're saying? How can a Calvinist really tell a person with sincerity, God loves you, when you don't know if he does or not? Christ died on that cross and paid for your sins, but you don't know if he did or not. Why would you be deceptive? Why would you lie? Either he did or he didn't. Can that child be saved if that child hears the gospel and believes it? Yes. You see, it affects Sunday school teachers. It affects Awana. It affects Bible clubs. When you know the truth and you believe the truth, you want to tell the truth. Whatever will be, will be. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. Or does it? really matter I believe it matters now here's John 3 16 rewritten for God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten son the whosoever predestined <coughs> in him should not perish but have everlasting life do you have to change the word of God I don't think we should change it I think we ought to leave it just like God said it that he so loved the world now all of this hopefully will help you to be a little wiser and understand not everybody believes the gospel the way God gave it. There's a lot of intellectuals out there that don't get it. Too smart for their own good. And they look down upon simple little know-nothings like the preacher here because we just don't get it. I know what they teach. I know what they teach as well as what they know, but I don't believe it. Therefore, there must be something missing upstairs in my, my elevator. Now, let me show you something. You'll notice when we do this little wild illustration, it's according to the truth of the gospel. Calvinists can't do this sincerely. This hand represents you and me. This wallet represents sin. We have all sinned. We're all in the same boat. Yes, we're depraved. We're totally incapable of saving ourselves. God loves us. He loves every one of us. But he hates what we do wrong. And the wages of sin is death. And since we've all sinned, we're all condemned. But God loves us, wants us to go to heaven. To go to heaven, you have to be perfect. The righteous is God. None of us are perfect. None of us are righteous. But you see, God loves all of us. There is no difference. We're all in the same boat. For all have sinned. So, God says you cannot earn eternal life. You cannot work your way to heaven. It's not by your works. So let's just put this turning away from sin. Put it out of it because that has nothing to do with it. Commit my life to Christ. That's my life and works. Forget that. That has nothing to do with this. God says you cannot save yourself. We need a savior. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's God in the flesh. Came into this world. Now, he had no sins. So he didn't have to die. So because we're all in the same boat, Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And how many are lost? All are lost. 
And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should be saved. But nobody can be saved if he doesn't do this one thing. He took all of our sins, paid for it on the cross, and came back from the dead. And he says that if we will believe that he did that for us, he would put this payment to our account. Now, I have a payment for all of my sins. Jesus is the payment. Jesus is the living proof. My receipt, the scars in his hand, he's my receipt. And how long am I going to have this receipt? How long is this receipt good for? <clears throat> Forever. I've got a payment for all of my sins. And see, I'm going to heaven. Not because of anything that I stopped, anything that I promised. I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did for me on the cross. That's what I'm trusting to get me to heaven. I don't depend upon all the things that I've stopped and all the good things that I do. My salvation is based upon one thing. Faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. There is no other salvation. Let's pray, shall we? With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. I'm going to ask you right now with heads bowed. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior. Maybe you've heard about it all your life. But friend, there is a difference. Are you trusting Him? Or are you trying to earn your way to heaven by the way you live? Where is your confidence? How do you know you're saved? Because of the Word of God or because of how you're living? If you've never really trusted the Lord, why not do it right now? It is your choice. Nobody can make you. But God loves you just the same. Even if you reject Him, He still loves you. But if you've never done it, would you trust Christ right now as your Savior? God said if you would trust Him, He will save you, give you eternal life. And He'll never cast you out and never lose you. I'm not going to have you forward, stand up, or embarrass in any way, but right where you're sitting, I'm going to ask for a raise your hand. Raising your hand does not save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you. And you said, Preacher, I will accept Christ as my Savior. It's my only hope of going to heaven. And I want you to pray for me. Would just slip in very quickly and put it right back down? Is there anyone at all? Anyone at all? In your own mind, between you and the Lord. Say, that made sense. I will trust Christ as my Savior. If you have a question, any of these men that you see when you walk out the door, they'll be glad to help you. Our Father, we thank you again for your blessings. Thank you for this opportunity to come together, to read, to hear, study. Because of all that you've done for us, we have eternal life. We know that we're going to heaven. And it's not because of anything that we've done, but because of that payment Christ made for us. We thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.